Good evening. Stand with me and uh, turn in your hymn books to page 335. Page 335. As we sing, He leadeth me. Blessed thought, O oh, words with heavenly comfort fraught. Whate'er I do, where'er I be, still tis God's hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Sometimes mid scenes of deepest gloom, sometimes where Eden's bowers bloom, by water still or troubled sea, still tis his hand that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Lord, I would clasp thy hand in mine, nor ever murmur, nor repine. Contend whatever lot I see, since tis my God that leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. And when my task on earth is done, when by thy grace the victory's won, in death's cold wave I will not flee, since God through Jordan leadeth me. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, by his own hand he leadeth me. His faithful follower I would be, for by his hand he leadeth me. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we do come before you, Lord, and we're thankful for your promise and, Lord, your offer and your willingness to lead us, Lord. And we just pray that, God, as we continue to sing unto you, our Heavenly Father, Lord, that we so desperately need in this world, Lord, and as we hear the preaching of your word, God, may we draw closer to you and, Lord, be willing to follow where you lead. And, God, we just pray that all that is said and done would bring glory and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to draw closer to you, Lord, have more of your spirit in our life, Lord, uh, unhindered by the flesh and distractions. And, Lord, we just pray that, God, you would help us to be more like you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Page 345, page 345. Where could I go? Living below in this so sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford. Striving alone to face temptation sore, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, where could I go, seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end, where could I go but to the Lord? Neighbors are kind, I love them everyone, we get along in sweet accord, but when my soul needs manna from above, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go, 
where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Life here is grand and toys I love so dear. Comfort I get from God's own word. Yet when I face the chilling hand of death, where could I go but to the Lord? Where could I go? Where could I go? Seeking a refuge for my soul, needing a friend to save me in the end. Where could I go but to the Lord? Amen. Page 409. Page 409. Page 409, farther along. Amen. Tempted and tried, we're off made to wonder why it should be thus all the day long. While there are others living about us, never molested, though in the wrong. Better along, we'll know all about it. Father, along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When death has come and taken our loved ones, it leaves our home so lonely and drear. Then do we wonder while others prosper, living so wicked year after year. Father along we'll understand oh, oh. Father along we'll understand why. Cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Faithful to death, said our loving master, a few more days to labor and wait. Trolls of the road will then seem as nothing as we sweep through that beautiful gate. Father along we'll under about it. Father along we'll understand why. Cheer up my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. When we see Jesus coming in glory, when he comes from his home in the sky, then we shall meet him in the bright mansion, where we'll understand it all by and by. Father along, we'll know all about it. Father along, we'll understand why. Cheer up, my brother, live in the sunshine. We'll understand it all by and by. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. And uh, I don't have a bulletin, but we do know that. Uh, thank you, Miss Alice. I think that's it for, for the singing. Is it the 24th to the 29th for the tent revival? And you absolute miracle that I remembered that without looking it up, but that's all right. June 24th to the 29th for the tent revival. And on the 23rd, which is a Thursday, um, we'll gather together as many as we can get to help set the tent, uh, well, set the tent up or help set everything else up. There is a lot that goes into it. Just the sound and the cameras and and everything. There's there's quite a bit that that needs to be done. So as many as can come, you will be welcome. And they, I think they're going to provide a meal uh, for those that come out to help set it up. So I think that's it as far as the announcements. We do want a couple of ladies each night, or is it just a couple of ladies throughout the whole week? Either way, to provide. Uh, grab and go kind of snacks each night af for afterwards. So um, I think that was it in the announcements. Um, I think that's it. We are going to have Brother Danny preach tonight. And then after Danny preaches for a few moments, we are going to tag team preach, as Pastor likes to call it. We called him this afternoon. And he said, I think that's what I want you guys to do. 
is to tag team preach, and he gave us a topic. And so Danny asked me when we normally do it, how often do we want to go? I said, we want to be pretty short. And he said, well, I'm always short. So, well, I thought he meant, I think he meant height-wise. I don't know if he's always short. No, he's never as bad as I think Pastor makes it sound like he goes on more than he does. He never preaches too terribly long, I don't think. But we're going to preach 20, 25 minutes each, and uh, it is warm in here, and it's going to get dark soon, and we want to get people home. So I think we're going to be out, I think we're going to be out at a good time tonight, uh, but we're going to go ahead and have Danny come forward and uh, give us the first uh, part of the message tonight. refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the poisonous, poisonsome pestilence. He shall cover thee with his feathers and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and thy buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night nor for the arrow that lieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. And uh, let's go on down, and we're, then we'll just look at a couple more verses here. And verses 10 through 12, it's, well, let's just read on down through the rest of them. Verse 7, a thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall... Bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. Let's go ahead and pray. 
Heavenly Father, thank you for this opportunity to be up here. As you know, I don't take it lightly. It's a very serious thing. Be with all those that are traveling. We're not here today. Our pastor and his family is there out west and everyone else. And all the prayer requests we have in our heart and mind. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, like I said, you may be seated. Pastor uh, wanted the message tonight to be about dwelling or to dwell. So the first thing then is we have to understand, well, what does that mean to dwell? Or your, what is your dwelling place? That is where you reside, where you live. And that could be a lot of different places. We dwell here at church. We dwell in our homes. We dwell in our cars. We dwell at work. Wherever we spend our time is, is our dwelling place. And the thing about that is, is that Jesus is always with us, dwelling with inside of us. And that is the important thing to remember, is that he is always with us all the time through the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, whichever you prefer. <clears throat> so it says there in verse 1, He that dwelleth or resides in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Well, the Almighty is the Lord God himself. So he's the one that we're abiding with, or he, imbibe, he abides in us through the Holy Spirit. And it doesn't say, at least uh, in Psalms, it will usually sometimes tell you who wrote the psalm. It doesn't say in my Bible uh, who wrote it, but supposedly David wrote this psalm. And if anyone needed to have the indwelling of God in them or with him, it would have been David because he had a lot of ups and downs in his life. So he knew that the Lord was with him. Verse 2, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, and my, my God, in him will I trust. Now, quiz question. It says there, I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. What other psalm is the word refuge used a lot? And I'll give you another hint. It was Martin Luther's favorite psalm. It starts off by saying, the Lord is my refuge and my strength. And it's repeated several times. Psalms 46 so when you get a chance, when you go home, look up Psalms 46, and you'll find that several times in there, it talks about God being his refuge, or you could even say his dwelling place. And I've read that, like I said, Martin Luther, that was uh, his favorite psalm. All right, verse 3, Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare or the trap of the fowler or of the hunter. And from the noise, noisome or loud or painful pestilence, uh, fatal epidemic, if you will. So obviously, you know, when this was written a long time ago, nobody had the idea that there would be COVID-19 that would come upon us or any other disease that we went through. But God is our refuge and our strength. He is our dwelling place. He will guide us and get us through. Well, then you say, well, that's not true, Danny, because you've had COVID, so obviously your God didn't do his job and protect you. Well, I disagree. Yes, I had COVID. Matter of fact, I had it twice. But you know what? I never blame God for it. I didn't say it's your fault because you didn't protect me. He watched over me while I had it. Even though I was hospitalized for overnight or one day, I never blamed God. It wasn't his fault. It's something that happens. We live, we live in a sin-cursed world. Things are going to happen. And God still watches over us even though we go through bad times. He is still our dwelling place. That doesn't stop because a bad thing happens. Amen? Okay, so I want to point that out. 
Verse 4, he shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. Now look at that. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shall thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. So in other words, we're being covered or protected. We're underneath him. He is covering us. Where in the book of John does it talk about being under God's protection and being in God's hand, in Jesus' hand, in God's hand also? What chapter of John does it talk about that? John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. And I'll just read it real quick. John chapter 10, verses 28 through 30. And it says there, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall perish. Is that what it says? What does it say? Never. Oh, thank you. They shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. So when we dwell in Jesus Christ, <clears throat> we're in, under his care, in his hand, if you will, and then in the Father's hand over top of it. Now, we can leave him, but he never leaves us. Okay? And when Jesus made that statement about that, and then Jesus said, I and my Father are one, that's when the Jews or the religious people got mad at him because they said, oh, now you're committing blasphemy. You're saying that you're God. So we dwell, God dwells within us and never leaves us, but we can leave him. We are always his child. Some people have a problem with that, but the dwelling is, all, is always there on God's part. And it says also in verse 4 that he's our shield and our buckler. So he's there to protect us, to give us defense and a buckler, like you, you buckle a seatbelt to secure you in. You're, we're secure in Christ if we have the faith to believe that he exists and he is our Lord and Savior. Okay, and that's what David was saying there, that he believed in God, that he, he would watch over him. Verse 5, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence, which again is a, a fatal epidemic or any type of disease that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. So, Psalms chapter 91. So again, to apply this to our lives today, with everything going on in the world, we need not be afraid. We need to be Cautious, use common sense that God gave us. But at the same time, we need to realize that we're in the dwelling place of the Lord, that he will guide and protect us as we go through uh, this life. And even when bad things do happen, he's still there watching over us. And once we go through something, we can look back on it and realize, well, hey, God brought me through this. It could have been a whole lot worse. But because of the dwelling of the Holy Spirit in us, in our faith, we'll get through whatever we have to go through. Now, I don't know what all is coming, but I do know that hopefully if something bad comes my way, I will have the right attitude and God will get me through it and God will get through all of us through whatever it is that we go through. People said to me when I found out about my heart condition and I had to get the pacemaker put in and a stint put in and this and that and whatnot, aren't you afraid to die? No, not at all. Why not? Because I believe in Jesus Christ. He lived and died and rose again for me. I believe that the Bible says I can know that I have eternal life, 1 John 5, 13. I am not afraid to die. 
Now, I don't know how I'm going to die if the rapture doesn't take place before that time, but I am not afraid to die because I know that my Redeemer liveth, okay? And I know I will be with him. And people just looked at me like, oh, wow, great. I believe that too. Amen, brother. And then others, coo, 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 coo. But that's okay. I, I, don't, I don't care what they think. So the dwelling, we have that indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God with us wherever we go. If we, if we dwell in our house, if we spend the day in our house where we're dwelling, God's there with us. Everywhere we go, he dwells with us. Where we go, he goes. Why do you think as a believer that you have a guilty conscience if you go somewhere you know you're not supposed to go, then he's there telling you, shouldn't be going there, don't go there. Brother Waldell mentioned that this morning about, you know, going certain places in other places you shouldn't go. That's what your conscience is. It's that inner voice inside of you that dwells within you telling you, yes, this is fine. No, this is not. And it's up to us to listen. Okay, now, let's clear up something here that could be kind of confusing uh, in Psalms 91. We may not get to Ephesians I, because I don't want to take away from Nathan's time. But uh, look at verse number 9 through 12. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation or dwelling place, there shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee, bear thee up in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against a stone. Oh, so as a believer, nothing bad is ever going to happen to me. No, bad things will happen. This here, I believe, is just referring to that the protection that God will give and that nothing happens without his permission. And yes, bad things happen. I mean, all you have to do is just read the rest of the Bible before this and after, and you'll see that bad things do happen. But God is there to get us through those things. Now, verse 11 and 12. For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Who quoted that in Matthew chapter 4? To Jesus when he was being tempted in the wilderness. The devil did. This is a quote that the devil used from Psalms 91 in Matthew chapter 4. But you see the difference is, is that the devil said, For he shall give his angels charge over thee. Well, that's pretty good. The angels will watch over me. Wow, I, I can, great. That's a great thing. But what about the rest of the verse? To keep thee in all thy ways. That's even better. So you want to talk about a dwelling place. It's better to have a dwelling place permanently all the time instead of in just in one area. <clears throat> and that's why you got to be careful with the devil because he's very tricky. He knows the Bible too. And if he can just twist it around enough to make it a lie sound believable, then he's got you. So you got to be careful there. Then look at verse um, 15 and 16. He shall call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. So even when we do go through bad things, <clears throat> 15 and 16 kind of go along with uh, 9 and 10 there, or 7 and 8. That God is with us, dwelling with us, no matter what we go through. Psalms 91. Psalms 91. Okay. Yes, ma'am. So that's the whole point of this, and I'm going to be done. The only thing about Ephesians I was going to bring up is chapter 3, where Paul mentioned that <clears throat> he wanted Christ to dwell in us by faith, that we may know the, the breadth, the length, the width, and the height of the love of God in, <coughs> in our lives. And it says that he wanted us to, to know that, the, 
to dwell, have God dwell in us by faith. And what does it say in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6? But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So it's all about faith and realizing that God is with us, he will dwell within us, he will never leave us, and he will get us through everything we have to go through. So I was going to go into Ephesians a little more, <coughs> but that is the, uh, the main point of it. So just remember, we're not alone, all right, that we do have Jesus with us, and we can always count and call on our friends to, to help and guide us. Thank you. All right, thank you, Danny. The book of Exodus, chapter 3. Exodus, chapter 3. Yep, Exodus, chapter 3. And uh, continue with this idea of dwelling, that God wants to call us out of the world, call us out of the old life, and into a new life with him. A lot of the principles and passages of the Bible talk about dwelling in him and uh, having a dwelling place in him and him dwelling in us. And so... Most of those go back to God wanting to pull us out from the old and bring us unto, unto the new. So Exodus chapter 3, we'll read the, verse, the first eight verses. Exodus chapter 3, verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the, piece, the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of the Father, of thy Father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the land of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of uh, the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. And so as we read this, we know that God is saying that I've seen the affliction of my people in their bondage, in their present life. And I want them to not be going through those things. I want to call them out from that and unto a place where they will worship me, where they will dwell with me and I with them. They will be my people and I will be their God. We know that that is God's desire to pull us out of the old and into a new dwelling place with him. And it is God's compassion. He sees the affliction of the Israelites here as they're in this bondage. And we know that uh, in principle, it is a parallel to when we are in bondage and sin. Before we know the Lord Jesus Christ, we are in bondage and God wants to bring us out. And there's also, after we're saved, there's times that we find ourselves backsliding and going back to the old things. And God wants to bring us back out of those things. And he wants us to get into those new places. And we know just by understanding and studying the Bible, we've preached on a lot of the Old Testament passages where 
we know that Israel does ultimately go and become a nation and that God blesses and that just as we are as individuals, Israel as a nation was up and down. It was very fickle. It was back and forth. It served God. And then when times got good because they were in the favor of the Lord, that they would begin to be hardened to that and they would turn their back on God, unto other gods, and then they would become afflicted and then they would cry unto God and God would deliver them out of that and he would bless them and then they would turn their back on him over time and and as we say that we know that that is a very foolish and illogical thing for us to do but we have such a tendency to do it and so when we when the bible says lean not to your own understanding there's a very good reason that the bible says not to lean to your on your own understanding because our own understanding when things start going well because we've gotten our heart right with God, we begin to harden our hearts to the blessings of God, to the blessing of having him in our life, having his protection and his direction and his covering over us, as Danny was talking about, him being our dwelling place and our refuge, all of these things, we get used to them and our hearts begin to wander. And so how much are we men that need the Lord Jesus Christ, not just for salvation, but to keep ourselves from drifting and, and going back into the things of the world. And we know that that's man's heart. That if we are left, if we just allow things to go and we just don't take our time to, to make ourselves be in the Word of God, make ourselves uh, build this relationship with God and being His Word and drawing closer to Him as, as is so often uh, the plea in our lives that we need to draw closer to Him. If we don't take responsibility and, and, and attend to those things, how easily it is just to slip back into the old. And, and we're going to see a couple of things. And again, I will be try, I try to be fast. I don't want to preach any longer than Danny did. So that should give me about an hour and a half, right? Because I think that's what Danny preached. But uh, just to hit these things, there's a few things. I've been listening to the book of Exodus. I talk about how I have that... Um, that, that app on my phone where as I'm getting ready for work and then I, I drive to work, I'm just able to listen. I find myself going back to Exodus a lot. And I just, I just like the passage. Last week I preached on the world is not our friend. I wanted to take that one step farther, but then also we know that the, the theme is the dwelling place. And so there is the, the ability to put those together, the fact that the world is not our friend. We need to take that seriously and not be a friend of the world, not allow ourselves to be a friend to the world and the world to be a friend unto us and give ourselves into the temptations and the pleasures of the world, what the world would want. If we're not a friend of the world and the world is not a friend to us, we ought not to be doing what the world wants us to do and what the world would tempt us to do. We've got to be doing something that shows that we're coming out from the old and we're moving forward into the new. And so we know that's what God wants to do in salvation, but then in the spiritual life, once we are saved, once you can call Israel as the people of God, we can call ourselves Christians born again because of our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can call ourselves the people of God. And in the same way as God's wanting to draw them out, he wants to draw us out from this world. Not physically, because that's going to happen at, the, happen at the rapture that we're physically taken out of this world. But spiritually, he wants us to, as the Bible says, come out from among them and be ye separate. So we look at Exodus chapter 4. I just wanted to look at that as far as to see that God's desire. He, he did this thing for Moses where he drove him to the side of, of, of the way and there was the bush burning, but it was not consumed. God's supernatural power. And to God, that's probably not even hard. That's probably the easiest thing that he could do just to make something burn and not be consumed. He's God. This probably isn't even hard for him to do. But it's hard for us to understand. Wait a minute. It seems like that tree, that bush would be consumed and the fire would dwindle down. But if, it, if God to God, that's not hard. But he wanted to do that to draw Moses' attention with this idea in mind. I have heard and I want to let my, I want to get my people out of their bondage. And so that's the reason we began with what that passage in chapter 3, but we go to, to, to chapter 4. And we're going to look at God drawing us out and what God wants to do when we're being drawn out. And I, I know at some point I want to say this, I'll just say this now, when God does draw us out, when God does draw Israel out of Egypt, when God does draw us out from the old and unto the new, 
there's so many things that we can see that the people of Israel go through. There's good and there's bad and there's ups and there's downs. There's times that they're close to God and there's times that they, they complain and they murmur and there's times when they have other gods in their lives, even in the midst of the mountain, that they can see the very presence of God up there. Even while that's happening, they still could turn their heart and make other gods. But then there's times when they do turn their hearts unto God and it's a beautiful thing when God wants to have that happen and we do turn our hearts unto him and we see the blessings that God has so I say that because when we do allow ourselves to be taken out of the old and into the new God wants to give us an adventure God wants to give us a life that is abundant and overflowing we see that he wants to give us a land that is flowing with milk and honey that's the land that he wants to give Egypt uh, the people of Israel when they come out of Egypt but God wants to give us of an abundant, overflowing life. That's not free from trials and free from hard times, but it's an adventurous, uh, uh, exciting. Uh, Brother Belcher was saying this morning that, that he was just saying, at some point we should preach on the joy of the Lord. And I know that I have mentioned that recently because we do find ourselves discouraged by seeing a lot of the things going on in the world and a lot of th things in the church where it just seems like people want to stay away from the church, and, and I just say that without trying to, to be unkind or uh, uh, just overstep my place by saying that, but it seems like the attendance is down and we could be discouraged from those things, and we need to be challenged by them. We need to know we do need to rise up, but that doesn't mean as we take the call to war that our life has to be drudgery. There is still joy in the Lord. I think the more that we do stand up and rise up as soldiers and we shed off the things of the world and we let those things fall away and the more that we do stand up and say, whatever happens, I'm going to let the old go and I'm going to move forward. I think that that's going to be the source of a lot of the joy that we have in the Lord is letting the things of the world go and the things of God becoming more prevalent in our lives. There's going to be a lot more joy just in that. But I know for myself, one thing I've realized about myself is one of the reasons I, I hesitate is because I like the things that are going on. I like the things in my life, even if they're not sinful. But I just like the comfort. I like the, the convenience. And I like the things that I own and I possess and that I use my time on. And, and I'm like, well, if I, if I ever stood up the way that I know I should for the Lord, I'd have to leave those behind. And what would, I, what would come into my life then? And it would just be a, always war always fighting, but even if it was, the cause is so great, I need to stop hesitating and get involved in that because the war and the cause is so great. But I don't think that it's only going to be being uncomfortable. I think there's going to be so many more blessings. And just to convince myself of that so much that I myself stop holding on to the things of the world and just do what I know to do, let go of that and move forward for the Lord. So there is going to be joy in the Lord, and there's going to be an adventure. There's so much that God wants for Israel, he can't give it to them when they're in Egypt. There's so much God wants to give us, he can't give it to us when we're still in the old things. So we look at Exodus chapter 4. God's power versus man's excuses. And Moses answered, this is Exodus chapter 4, man, Moses answered and said, But behold, they will not believe me, nor hearken to, unto my voice, for they will say, The Lord hath not appeared unto thee. So Moses' first thing to say unto the Lord, when the Lord said to go and tell the people that I have heard their cry and I want to let them go, is Moses said, I will be unconvincing. I will not be able to persuade them. They will not believe that you've appeared unto me. I'll tell them about the bush and I'll tell them how it was not consumed. I'll tell them uh, of our encounter, of, of my encountering you and, and what you've said unto me, but they won't believe that. So Moses immediately started making an excuse. They're not going to believe me. And then we look in verse 2, and the Lord said unto him, what is in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. And the Lord said unto Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. Now, I grew up on a farm. It was not our farm, but we had a lot of, it was 100 acres. We had a lot of trees and grass and stuff. We encountered snakes growing up. It is not a good idea to grab a snake by the tail. But God here says to do it. To grab a snake by the tail is the same as just putting, you might as well put your hand by the snake's mouth. 
because that snake's able to just move right around from the tail and just bend right around and bite your arm or whatever else he can get to. So that's not a very wise way to pick up a snake. But God is saying it to him because God is in control of this situation. And he said uh, uh, to pick it up. And he put forth his hand and caught it. And it became a rod in his hand. So God is showing him, I am in control. In verse 5, that they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers and the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said, furthermore, unto him, put now thine hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand into the bosom, and he went and took it out. When he took it out, behold, his hand was leprous as snow. Verse 7, and he said, put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as uh, his other flesh. So the sign of the rod that turned to a serpent and back into a rod, the hand put it into under his covering and it became leprous. And then he put it back and it became as the other flesh. So God's showing that I am in control of this situation. Verse 8, and it shall come to pass if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the, of the first sign, that they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, neither hearken unto thy voice. So if you go and they don't believe it, and they don't believe the rod, and they don't believe the hand turned to leprosy, and then back, if they don't believe these, that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou uh, takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. So we see God showing Moses his power. Moses cannot give any credit of this to anybody but the Lord. And he's telling him, I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You know who I am. I am the God that has called Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob out and you know who I am. I'm the God that was in that bush. And I'm the God that turned the rod to a serpent and back. Your hand to leprosy and back. And I'm the God that, that will do this with the river, with turning it to blood. He sees what God is doing. And it's very interesting to me to take a look at verse 10. And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent. And Danny and my brother and I, we have devotions. Um every night and we this was something that I pointed out that in the very the very second the moment after God did these things Moses goes right back to his own weaknesses and, and that's a very interesting point for us to understand we see what God can do but we often make the excuse but I can't do we not understand yet that God is trying to show us that he can but he immediately goes to I know you can do these things, Lord. I see what you're doing. That's, that is the miracle. They are going to believe that, but I'm still weak. He says, I am not eloquent. Neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made God man's mouth? Or who, hath ma who maketh the dumb or the deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. I heard the preacher preaching on this, and he, he alliterated it somehow. I don't remember how he alliterated it, but he came up, he was, he was pointing out the excuses that Moses had. They're not going to believe me. I'm unconvincing. I'm ineloquent. But this is an interesting phrase. Send, I pray thee, by the hand of whom thou wilt send. Do you know what Moses was saying? Whoever else you want to send him, send. Send. Send someone else is what Moses was saying. He said, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. Send someone else. And verse 14, God wasn't angry at the excuses, but God was angry at the unwillingness. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses. He said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know that, thou can, uh, that, thou, that he can speak well. And also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. 
And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And so just take these, these verses here, and we look at Moses, even though God's doing the miracles, Moses is still focused on his own weaknesses, which is funny because in our pride, often we're thinking of how sh our own strengths, but when it comes to making excuses, we'll take our strengths, we'll take our weaknesses, we'll take whatever we can get at our hands to say, oh, I can't do this, I can't go because of this, when it's really revealing the unwillingness. And if we grow up, and, and that's a part of being grown up, I think that's a part of being more responsible, is understanding that making excuses is a childish thing to do. If you can't do it, say you can't do it. But God is removing all the obstacles to why he can't. But at the end of the day, it's not that he can't. It's just that he doesn't want to. He's not willing to. And so the first thing is God's power versus man's excuses, and then God's persistence in man's affair. Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And as I'm going through this, I don't remember exactly where it is. It's in the next couple of chapters that Pharaoh in his heart and heart says he's going to let them go, but they only go out a little bit out of Egypt. And there they can sacrifice to the Lord. But Moses is saying, God had said, let us go out in the wilderness, at least three days' journey. Go out three days' journey. Not just a little bit out of the old and into the new. Three days out of the old and into the new. Get some distance between you and the world. Let us have that attitude that it's not just a little bit out of the old. A little bit. Not thinking out of the box, but right up against the sides of the box. Not saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do what I'm supposed to, but just as little, as absolutely little as I can. No, get ourselves out of the world as far as we can. Sell ourselves out to the Lord as much as we can. When he's called us out, let's get as far as we can out of the old. But what I want to say is, is that God had not changed his mind as to what he wanted to have happen. Through all this encounter, with, we know that, that Pharaoh is, is putting the burden hard, and in, in chapter 5, he really makes it hard on the people of Israel. We got into that last week, how the world is not our friend. As soon as they began to talk about God wanting us to go and to sacrifice unto him out into the wilderness, that Pharaoh didn't appreciate that, and he said they're too idle, so he put on the same amount of work but less supplies. He didn't provide the things they needed to do the work. So now they had to go get them and do the same amount of work, which is double the work. And they saw that they were not in a good situation because of how unfriendly the world is to God's people. God's people or the world does not have a lot of patience or tolerance when it comes to God's people, especially when we stand off, when we start being a salt and the savor, the salt and the salt makes things taste good, but a salt is also an irritant. We understand that if we were to ever stand up the way we're supposed to, we would be a blessing to the world, but be also an irritant. They would not want us to be here more than they do now. They don't like the conservative uh, rules and, and restrictions and all that. They don't like the conservative biblical teaching of what God has said to do, thus saith the Lord. They don't want to hear it. But they'll less tolerate it the more we get ourselves separated from this world and closer to God. And so we see that the world is not their friend, but we see that God's persistence. A couple of things is that the trouble didn't disappear in, immediately. The trouble got worse. And, and we've seen that in stories and Hollywood movies. We've, we've seen this uh, portrayed in, in, again in stories and different mediums that before, and it's, and it's a true statement a lot of times, just before the, the hero breaks through or just before the answer comes along, the strength of those opposing you seems to get stronger and they seem to push their thumb down harder on people. But we stay faithful to the Lord knowing that he is on his way, knowing that he is watching us, that he is as, as Danny spoke, that he is covering us. He is watching over us. So the trouble didn't immediately go away. The trials are not unseen by God. God sees what we're going through. When their work got that much harder, it's in the next chapter God starts doing things. God starts moving. He said that he was going to, and, and when the trials came harder, God started to move. And then the timing will bring God glory. 
The timing is going to bring God glory. If He delivered them at this point, He, he had prophesied 400 years that they were going to be in Egypt. I don't think always everybody understands that God had prophesied that, that they were going to be in Egypt for 400 years. And it was with God's timing. Does God cause bad things to happen? And sometimes things happen according to God's plan. As Danny said, sometimes things just happen. But it is all under God's permissive will. God can control everything if he wants, but God allows life to happen. But there's certain things that God does, the end of which brings him glory. And him being a good, loving, merciful, holy, perfect God deserves the glory. And it always goes back in my mind, and I try to communicate this, that if the temporal things need to be affected, that the temporal things are done away with, or they die, or they're taken away, we can't be angry at the temporal things being taken away, because they were going to go away anyways. We could hold on to them for all of our lives, but we were eventually going to die. We can hold on to them, but they're eventually going to decay. We can hold on to them, but eventually our heart will become hardened to where even the most... The, the biggest bank account in the world, we won't be satisfied with it. We, we know that those are the disease that man has, that these things will not ultimately satisfy. So if the temporal things are sacrificed for God's glory, it is okay because they weren't going to last forever anyways. And so ultimately, if God gets glory, we need to understand that that's a better thing than those temporal things Then we were able to hold on to them for another minute, for a little bit longer. They were eventually not going to be in our hands anyways. Let them go. Be willing for them to be taken away from us that God receive the glory. And he is eternal. And we, and we walking with him, our walk with him and our relationship with him is eternal. Those are the eternal things. But God was persistent. He didn't change his mind. I think of uh, Jonah when God said for Jonah to go to the uh, Ninevites and Jonah went the other way and then he caused the storm and they cast him over and he was in the whale and then he said you know what I know that I've sinned what did God do as soon as he got out of the whale he said I want you to go to Nineveh I'm not a parent but I just know that sometimes it's probably like that with a kid clean up your room they scream they cry they throw a fit they throw around they, they reel around on the ground having an absolute temper tantrum as soon as that's done you're like okay now you're done with that clean up your room God doesn't change his mind because of what man says and does in response to him. He knows, I want to get my people out of here. So the plan is for me, for you, to tell them to let you let my people go. And then all of this happens. They make the, the, the burden harder. When it's all done, God still says, let my people go. He didn't change his mind because of what man did. So God's persistence in man's affairs the trouble doesn't stop immediately. The trials are not unseen by God, and the timing will bring God glory. And then we see the plagues versus man's rebellion. And for sake of time, the river of blood, the frogs, the, the lice. I wrote down lice, but my Microsoft Word wrote life. <laughs> the lice, the flies, the cattle's dying, the boils, the hail, the locusts, the darkness, and the firstborn dies. Those are the ten plagues. And I've got the passages right here, but it's in chapter 7 through 11 that these plagues come to be. And we'll end with this. I've written a paragraph, and we'll just, we'll just go through this and, and conclude. We know that Pharaoh does ultimately let them go. We know that God provides the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We know that Pharaoh isn't done chasing them. We know that God parts the Red Sea for Israel to cross. We know that the hearts of the people were fickle and turned back Toward Egypt, their hearts did, and it's despair whenever hardships arose. We know that the people stood afar off from the mount when God had ascended upon, descended upon it in thunders and lightnings and clouds. We know that in the shadow of the mount, the people made false gods and credited them for bringing them out of Egypt. We know that God was always faithful to Israel, and when Israel followed God, he gave them a place to dwell. And we know that God can provide a dwelling place of safety and peace for those who leave the old behind and follow him into the new, into the unknown. If we don't know what it is, if it's unknown, we go by faith, and faith pleases God. And we know that God can provide a dwelling. Um, uh, we, we must leave the old behind. We, 
must stop allowing excuses over God's power. That's one of the things I see in my own life is just making the excuses. We must acknowledge God's commands do not change and we must deal with them. We must also understand that God will pass judgment on sin and on his enemies. So we put the old behind. The past is the past and belongs behind us. Though pain may remain and scars may remind us. We learn from each failure and advance from success. Having given all to God, we progress. The present is now and demands our attention. Though distractions we face are too many to mention. We must live in the moment before it is gone. Doing now what we know to be right, we press on. The future's before us, we press on to attain it. God's promise is sure and by faith we can gain it. He has brought us this far, so how can we doubt him? We can do all things through Jesus, but nothing without him. Just a little poem talking about putting the old behind you, living in the present, pressing on toward the future. Stop making excuses. Respond to God's patience with obedience. Know that God will judge sin and his enemies and follow him out of the old and into the new. God has so much more for us on the other side. And we hold on to the old. We love the old. How, how, I don't know what word, how crazy, how foolish, how unreasonable is it that when they got out into the wilderness, they didn't have the whips on their back. They didn't have to eat the the gross things that, what is it, uh, the Bible talks about the, the leeks and the garlics that they had to eat in Egypt. They didn't have that anymore. God was providing them manna and uh, water to come out of rocks. And God was proving that he was their God, even though, okay, some of the things were difficult. Why would you prefer that, what you had before? But because this was too hard for them. I don't understand that. And that's who we are ourselves. That's why we must lean on to God's understanding. Because I don't even know how that can make sense, but I do it. That I would choose the old rather than the new. which Because the new gets a little bit hard. I prefer the whips. I prefer the leeks and the garlics. I prefer the captivity. I prefer the old over the new. Let us not be those people that, that God wants to bring us out to a place where we're dwelling with him and he's dwelling with us. And that relationship is that, that's how it goes. We're his people, he's our God. But we just, we want to keep going back to the old. So we need to allow God to draw us out. He wants to save us through salvation. He calls us and saves us out of sin. We're not free from sin. We still live in this body. It's not gone away, the old man. We're, it's still here and present with us. But we have the power, we have the choice now to turn our back on the old man and turn it unto God. And we will not be perfect, but we can sure start to hate that old man more than we ever have before. I'm so tired of him tricking me and luring me back. And I'm so tired of him when I know what's to right to do and I know to go forward with the Lord, him tricking me into thinking that it's okay to hold back, that it's okay to go back, to allow ourselves to come out of those things, knowing that the new is so much more than the old. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this time we have together. And as Miss Alice comes to play a a song of invitation, Lord, we just pray that God, your spirit and your word would work in our hearts. And God, we just pray for your, your wisdom and your leading in this time. And God, just if we come forward or if we just stay where we are, God, that it would be your spirit moving us to draw closer to you, Lord. Away from this world, God, this world, all the things in this world, the Bible says they're temporal and they're passing. But more, more and more take hold of the eternal things that will not pass away. God, we pray that you be with us in this time.
right, thank you all for coming out, and we'll go ahead and dismiss in prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, we do thank you for your grace and mercy in our lives. God, give us that vision, Lord, that the land to which we're going, to the promises that you have for us, Lord, they're so much greater than whatever it is we leave behind. And God, may we learn to love you more than we love them, more than we love ourselves, more than we love the things and the, in the, in the relationships and the influences of the world. We love you more. God, you are worthy. May we understand that. And God, may your Holy Spirit just draw us closer to you and farther from this world and its worldliness and its temporal things. And unto the eternal things, we pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.